Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the Future Ready Librarian podcast, Leading from the Library. And I am so thrilled today to invite my friend Len onto the show. Hi, Len. Hey, Shannon. It's so good to see you and to chat. I know, even though it's virtual, like the rest of the universe is working right now, it's it's good to see your face, and and I'm looking forward to to visiting with you. Yeah, I am so excited. And Len, first start out maybe by just introducing yourself and telling a little bit too, not about your, um, just about your current job, but your your background too. Oh, it's a long and crazy story. Um, so yeah, I. I have, to, I have to really go back to the beginning because it does kind of frame my why for being an educator and being in the doing the work that we're doing. So I am the second of five kids. Uh, I grew up in rural, very rural, capital R, central Louisiana, the middle of the Piney Woods. Uh, my mom was a single mom. She was the cafeteria, one of the cafeteria ladies at my elementary school. Uh, so we grew up very, you know, very poor, you know, uh, you know, very country. I like to call it country with a K, you know, very, very very, you know, redneck background, that kind of thing. Um, but I had an English teacher in seventh grade who who told me in no uncertain terms that I absolutely will go to college and I absolutely will uh, get out of this little dinky town that we live in and 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 make something of myself. Um, and that that um, that influence that she had over me uh, was the reason I went into it, went into education and became an English teacher, just like she was. Um, I also was a fair athlete in school, so I also coached. At the same time, I enjoyed, you know, participating in athletics. So I wanted to be an athletics coach as well. Uh, so I've coached fast basketball, volleyball, track, cross country, a little bit of softball, kind of everything, mostly girls, uh, mostly girls athletics throughout my career. So I did that for about 10 years. Uh, I moved around a couple of times. I met my future wife and she told me I had to go to Texas. So I did. Uh, <laughs> she, she also told me things in no uncertain terms. Um, so I went to Texas and uh, we kind of bounced around a little bit as 20 somethings tend to do. Uh, I landed in a great district in Round Rock outside of Austin. And I was teaching and coaching there for a couple of years. And I, in Texas, uh, standardized testing, um, I, I apologize on behalf of Texas to the rest of the country because standardized test, testing kind of began there, you know, the high stakes stuff. Um, I was in the midst of all that, teaching Seth seventh grade English, which was reading and writing. And we, my kids got to take two high stakes standardized tests. Uh, and that started to wear on me a little bit. I got pretty tired of teaching to the test. I really wanted to connect with kids in a different way. And every principal I've ever worked with said, oh, you ought to become an administrator. You ought to become an assistant principal and the principal, you'd be so good at it. And I took a look at the work that they do and the, and the demands that are placed upon them and, and the stress level and the hours that they spent. And I was just like, no, I don't think this is what I want to do. And at that time, ALA was doing this push to, to um, bring younger teachers into librarianship uh, because of the graying of the profession. We had a lot of librarians who were retiring or nearing retirement age. And I had an amazing librarian uh, that I worked with at Noel Grisham Middle School, shout out to the Grizzlies, who um, was the best librarian I'd ever worked with. She was the only one who uh, I actually saw teach. Uh, she was the only one who had collaborated with teachers and brought in students to the library to teach them uh, and do research and that sort of thing. So she sends out this email um, just as I was having this kind of career crisis. And, and, you know, one of the lines was, you know, do you find yourself compulsively uh, rearranging your friend's coffee table books? I'm like, yeah, I kind of do that. You know, do you love working with kids and love working with technology? I said, yeah, I love doing all that kind of stuff. That's perfect. So that's how I became a librarian. Uh, I took over for her at that school when she left to open a new school. Uh, I left that school to open a new school myself in the same district. Uh, I, after that, I worked for the Texas State Library, Texas Library, uh, State Library and Archives Commission for a couple of years to do their statewide database program. Uh, my wife and I decided we need to pick up and move. So we went to Oregon, where I was a district librarian for a couple of years. Then we had a baby and needed to get closer to the grandparents without going all the way back to Texas. We, we, we found out that we love mountains and we love seasons and Texas is neither. So we decided to go <laughs> to Denver, which is how I ended up in Denver Public Schools. So now I work as the um, Library Technical Services Manager uh, in, in DPS, which is awesome. It's a big urban district. We serve almost 100,000 kids. We have about 30 people in our department, uh, ed tech and library services. So I get to work with an amazing team and I get to serve 150 plus campuses and just a, a, a vast variety 
of uh, types of schools and situations and just be helpful as much as I can to the folks that I work with. So yeah, there's, there's my life in a nutshell. That's an amazing story. I absolutely love that. I have, I knew some of that, but not all of it. So thank you for sharing that. (laughs) You bet. And you're so lucky to be in Denver, one of my cities. So I know (laughs) they will get back there and I know, I know in person, like real human being. Well, today I'm really looking forward to talking with you just about the lessons that we've learned during remote learning. And I think you being in a large district in a big city, working with a lot of not only teachers, but so many kids and families, I think this conversation is going to be so timely and just so wonderful for everybody. I know it's going to be great. And let's start out just by thinking about how have Future Ready Librarians adjusted our practices to not only continue to provide library services and access to our resources, but also lead our schools and districts in reimagining what libraries can be. I think that's the big thing. Yeah, that's a big question, right? It's, yeah. it's, it's, I, I noticed that a lot, not only in, in our district with folks who were kind of asking us, you know, what do we do now? How do we, how do we continue our library work? How do we move forward? Uh, but also nationwide, you know, I'm, I'm very active on Twitter and I participate in a lot of PLNs through that. And I, I saw the same questions arising, you know, from about mid-March when uh, lots of schools had to shut down and go remote and go virtual learning, you know, through the summer and into the fall. And that's something that I don't, I don't have the answers. And a lot of the answers that I have started to rattle around in my head have largely been stolen from my colleagues. You know, that's what we do in a, in a professional learning network is we share, hey, we're trying this at our school. Um, we're kind of doing this technique and we're, we're, we're doing this um, strategy to, to keep, you know, keep the library program not only functioning, but also kind of as, as the question put, uh, it provides us an opportunity to lead. And whether or not we grasp that opportunity has a lot to do with our mindset and has a lot to do with how we approach our work and our profession and just our lives in general. And that's something too that I've seen in, in Denver and across the country is that the people who are solution oriented and are nimble and are able to change gears quickly and change direction quickly and adopt and adapt to you know these crazy changing situations that we live in are the ones who have been most successful. They've not only continued to serve our kids and our families, they've also stepped into that leadership role by providing a model for others. Um, one of the things that uh, I knew that I was going to have to do this summer was figure out a way for us to return to a hybrid in-person learning situation, because at some point the pandemic's going to wind down and we'll have kids back in our buildings and we need to be able to serve those students safely. Uh, so I developed uh, with a lot of reading and a lot of research, I developed some, uh, some strategies that our library staff can use. And our state uh, library coordinator, uh, Becky, has also posted that on the Colorado State Library website um, and lots of other you know, districts around the, the state and, and maybe elsewhere, I'm not sure, have adapted and adopted some of those strategies. So I think that's one way we can lead is not only do things differently and do things maybe better, but also share it out. And that's one of the things that, that I feel like school librarians really need to grow into is sharing the good work that we're doing. Um, and I used to say this a lot when I was in Texas and, and presenting at conferences. What is what is your day-to-day job that you just do? Uh, might seem boring to you, but it might be completely revolutionary to somebody else who just hadn't thought of that. Yeah. So I think that, that sharing is gonna be the big piece that keeps us in that leadership role for our, for our campuses, or our districts. Yeah, definitely. I know I wanna see what you develop now because I think that's one of the big questions, right? Like. We opened our library, well, we did a little test run this week with our fourth graders, and we've been delivering books because we're all face-to-face at the Invita right. with some remote learners at home still. And we had a fourth grade class come in and just test it out. And I mean, we're a very small, you know, pretty small school, mm-hmm. but it was really interesting just to talk through, like not only with us in the library, but even with our kids, you know, having sure. them because, you know, I want them to also be empowered, like, you know, and they were 
they were so great at like, we have to sanitize our hands and we have to wear a mask all the time. And, you know, it would be really great if we brought our Chromebooks and we could use Destiny. Like they were thinking of all these great ideas. And I think that's a big question though, is, and it's kind of a scary thing to think about. And so that's something that we'll have to make sure we share in the description, a link to that. So sure. everybody can see that work that you've done. Absolutely. Yeah. And this is so important for us to define how we are going to serve our students and our teachers and our caregivers and community, because if we don't define how that's going to be done, our leadership is going to stick. And, and this has happened in some of our schools. Our leadership is going to stick us in a classroom yes. uh, to teach or to be a pair uh, to be an aide or on playground duty or, or something like that. And, and that happens when we're not being proactive, when we're not sharing what we can do and how we can contribute, um, you know, we, we allow things to happen to us because we weren't proactive and, and putting that out there. Like, here's how I'm going to impact the lives of kids through, through this pandemic. So, yeah, well, I know, yeah. I know it's October, but yeah. <laughs> We've never worked harder. We've never worked harder, <laughs> but I think that it's going to make us so much better. Well, one thing that I think a lot about too, when I was thinking about Denver and we have a home also in Denver and so Denver's dear to our heart. And I think about the big job that you have serving the kids all around the city. And one question that I wanna ask is how has this pandemic really heightened the inequalities across state and districts and campuses? How do you see that? Yeah, this has been something that I've really been thinking a lot about um, before the pandemic, but definitely, you know, like you said, it, it, it highlights inequities across districts and states and schools. Um, and Denver is no different than any other place. We have our wealthy neighborhoods. We have our kids who are uh, who have lots of support at home, maybe a couple of college educated parents and, you know, that sort of thing. And we also have kids that are just living hand to mouth. We have lots of kids who are experiencing homelessness. Yeah. We have lots of kids who are very housing in instable and might be mo moving from place to place. They could be couch surfing that we have the, we run the gamut, like lots of large districts do and in, in smaller districts as well. And the thing that I've noticed, and this this actually came from a conversation that that you had had earlier, is uh, you know talking about how your kids at Van Meter were went pretty well to remote learning because they were comfortable with their technology. They had teachers teach with technology, students learn with technology uh, in the normal day to day face to face operations that we had before the pandemic, and those schools who had that advantage had a much better time transitioning to virtual and remote learning because you know, we, we had students and families who couldn't turn their Chromebooks on. You know, we ordered 30,000 Chromebooks and hotspots and distribute them. So the, the gadgets weren't the problem. We were able to get those out to almost everybody who needed it. But, you know, that device does no good if there is, has been no prior instruction yes. in how to log in, how to use the applications that we have. We have a lot of great, um, we have a lot of great databases. We have a lot of great uh, software that we use in our district, but um, our schools invariably in the poorer and blacker and browner communities didn't get instruction with those devices. Why? Mm -hmm. I have no idea. Um, maybe it's a maybe it's a, a bit of a deficit mindset in that you know those kids need paper and pencil. Those kids can't be trusted on a computer. Those kids can't behave on a computer. Whatever the whatever the deficit mindset is it's in place which is totally faulty by the way um, has prevented those students from having those rich technologically enriched learning opportunities that our more affluent kids have had and the pandemic just made that worse right yeah. these kiddos went home and had you know just had never done this before had never learned in this way um, you know so it, it, it just heightened those inequities. We tried. One of the things that I'm super proud of our, our ed tech and library services department has done is we created a YouTube channel, uh, mostly for teachers, but also for care caregivers and also for students of just how to do things, you know, how to log in to Clever, how to log into your databases, how to use your Schoology or Seesaw uh, learning management systems to, to access the content, how to get in touch with your teacher, how to properly send an email. Yeah. You know, all these little things that that should be a regular course of learning. Uh, you know, we had to kind of backwards 
backfill some of that missing skills. Uh, and our translation department's been great. We have a huge immigrant community in Denver. So mm -hmm. our translation department has translated a lot of the work that, that our team has done into as many different languages as humanly possible so that all of our families have access to that content and can get into uh, the, the virtual and remote learning piece. But again, yeah. had, we, had we had a more equitable stance ahead of that, mm -hmm we could have avoided a great number of these hurdles that we then had to jump after the pandemic broke out. Yeah. And I don't think Denver is that different from any other district in the country uh, that serves a diverse population. You know, we all have struggles with that. But I think one of the things that I'm really excited about our relatively new superintendent who, poor, poor Susanna has had to deal with two crises. She had a teacher strike and then she had this. So it's just been, she's, she's never had a chance to catch her breath, but, but one of her core tenants, one of the core tenants of our school board is really having everything we do focused on equity first and then working out from there. And, and I really feel like we're on the cusp of, of making some gigantic shifts in the way we do te teaching and learning. And I'm really hoping, you know, the future ready framework is going to be a place to, to, to turn, to make sure that we are indeed student centered in, in the way we do things. Yeah, that is amazing. I mean, that's a model that other school districts, you know, need to look at all of the great things that, that you're doing in Denver and, and just, you know, within your district, how you're serving not only your kids, but the caregivers and families also. And I know that I can't imagine what it must look like, you know, getting, how are you guys addressing like doing anything like with uh, books or are the librarians connecting with kids like I'm so curious on what that looks like right now. Yeah, the thing that the thing that's great about Denver and the thing that also made me lose all the rest of my hair about Denver <laughs> is the only consistency <laughs> is the inconsistency from building to building and campus to campus. We have six learning networks, you know, so our the schools are divvied up into six, you know, regional zones. Yeah. And each one has an instructional superintendent, each one has an operations superintendent. So they're almost like mini miniature districts. And then within that, you know, every school, uh, the principal is the agent of change. And that's kind of the philosophy that we've had. So every school operates very differently. So because every school operates very differently, every school library operates very differently. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, our staffing at campus libraries is very uneven. Uh, we have one campus that has two full-time librarians and we have many, many campuses with no librarian whatsoever and no library program mm -hmm. uh, and lots of campuses that are staffed by part-time paraprofessionals, full-time paraprofessionals, full-time teacher librarians, a teacher who does library one period a day. I mean we, we just have every there is no consistency whatsoever. So however we have some librarians that have been absolute rock stars. We have one of our librarians who has taken it upon herself to uh, actually stole the idea from you with the with the uh, the book hub she decided to put uh, order a magnet for the side of her car. She drives a Mini Cooper and she has a little uh, bookmobile magnet that she has on the side of her car and she delivers books that students have requested to their homes. Awesome. She sent us a couple pictures. They've, they've, been, they've been so sweet to see and she does middle school. So this is uh, a really intense need for those kiddos. So because most of our kids are still remote, they're still learning from home, um, we are doing a great deal of pushing of our ebook collection, which um, a hidden benefit of the pandemic is we've got some additional funding. So we're able to buy more ebooks. We have about 30,000 titles now awesome. and almost 100,000 copies. Yeah. So, so we have a, a huge ebook collection and it's seen ridiculous growth. We had 56,000 checkouts, I think in September. Wow. So um, yeah, yeah, it, it's had it's had huge growth. So we've been able to leverage the gadgets that the kids have at home uh, for them to access our electronic resources. We have several enterprising librarians who are doing curbside pickup. They're doing uh, like Julie at Manual. She's doing the the bookmobile with her Mini Cooper, and I need to send you the pictures. They're really you cute. You have to send me the pictures. Oh yeah, you'll get the pictures. Don't worry. I'm gonna I'm gonna blast. I'm gonna put her on blast. She's gonna see that, and it's gonna be great. But um, so we have people that are coming up with unique solutions that are, but, but each one is, is unique to the situation. You know, lot, unfortunately, a lot of our staff have been pulled into uh, the playground duty or uh, helping to supervise uh, kids who are learning remotely, but in the building. So it's a very, it's a very fluid situation. We don't really have a single model yet of what that looks like. The only thing that um, I can say that is going pretty consistently across our district is 
we have a plan in place for when we get our kids back in the yeah. to do um, classroom delivery or kind of a quasi curbside pickup outside the library doors in some of our buildings. But again, it, it comes down to how many hours the library staff actually has to, to work during the day. I know that's that's a big thing too. We my library associate and I look at each other a lot at the beginning of the day and then at the end of the day and like where did the time go? Like never yeah. been here. And so you guys are doing really, yeah. really, really great work. <laughs> We're trying. We're trying. It's it's a it's it's a tough deal. Um just because like I said, of the the inconsistency uh, across our buildings, you know, our principals have um, have decided to use our library staff in just a, a thousand different ways. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that's going to be a common occurrence. I think as kids start to come back into the building is most of our, uh, not most, wrong word, lots of our staff have um, family members that they're taking care of. They themselves might be medically compromised. And, mm -hmm. you know, our district has really done a great job of prioritizing people's say, safety and health and has allowed staff to opt out of going back to in-person. Um, which is awesome because we're looking out for our people, which is, you know, really, really important. And it's created a lot of shortages. Yeah. So they have asked central office staff like me to volunteer to go into buildings and teach or substitute teach or, you know, be a para or whatever. So I'm waiting to hear what school I'll get to go to, but I get to go be with kids, which is going to be awesome. So exactly. I'm really, yeah. And, you know, like we said earlier, these are opportunities that we can really show what we can do as future ready librarians and exactly. how we can lead beyond the library. And people are going to remember that and it's going to yeah. stick. And I think, you know, whatever we do, and I know that I did things, you know, when this hit in March that, you know, was not part of what was on my job description, but I didn't even ask. I just started doing and we need to remember that. That's the, that's the great yeah. thing. Yeah. And that comes down to the attitude that we take toward these things. You know, my, my initial thought was, wow, how am I going to get everything done that I have to do now and supporting 154 campuses mm -hmm. and be in a building, you know, yeah. possibly five days a week, maybe three or four days a week, who knows what's going to look like. But, you know, the other side of that coin is it's an advocacy opportunity. And I really hope yeah. I get to go into a building that doesn't have a well-supported library program because... Oh. Awesome. That gives me that chance to give to have that conversation. Oh, that would be great. Yeah. <laughs> You're the best, Len. I love oh, it. Oh, thanks. And Stop I love it. this conversation. <laughs> it's been so great. And you know, tell people where they can follow all the great things that you do online. Yeah. So I'm on Twitter. Twitter's kind of my primary vehicle for professional social connecting. And I'm at Lynn Bryan25. Um, it's my high school basketball number because Lynn Bryan was taken. Apparently he's a rocket scientist in Florida, so I'm going to let him have that. He's doing some good work. Um, but yeah, that's that's my primary um, uh, way of, of connecting with folks. And then our, our library services staff also have a Twitter account. It's DPS Libraries. Uh, they post amazing content, and it's mostly our collection development team. Uh, they post amazing content. They do before and after shots, like after they go in. This team of four ladies will go in and completely renovate a library. It's like something off HGTV. It's awesome. They'll move shelves around. They'll weed. They'll move furniture. They'll it, it, the and the before and after pictures they post on that DPS Libraries Twitter account and Instagram and Facebook um, are amazing. So that's worth seeing just to get ideas of like how to renovate a space. Um, but yeah, that's that's where we are. Oh, well, thank you so much. I of course. Can't wait to see what you have to share with us. Make sure you share that with us so we can share and just to keep up with all the great adventures in Denver. You're making a huge difference. Oh, thank you so much. It's such a great honor to get to talk to you and get to be part of the podcast. And, you know, I'm, I'm excited to share a lot of the great things that are happening in Denver. Yeah. And I have to have a big shout out to, to, follow it and all the support that they give us and future ready librarians and so more to come and we'll keep up with you too Lynn so have a great day thank you so much you too Shannon thanks thank you for joining us for the future ready librarian podcast leading from the library I would like to also thank our sponsor, Follett Learning, for their amazing continued support.